we will, uh, without further ado, we're having our own member, uh, board member, Scott Taylor. He is from, you know, as he told earlier, from uh, Money Exchange, Private Money Exchange. He'll be talking about moving from debt to wealth. Give him a welcome. Yes. yes. What did you say? I said, do I need to use this microphone? Yes. yes. Okay, I'll use it then. Use two. Where's the second one? I'll bring you one. Okay. So today's presentation, I've entitled it Resolving Debt. And in August of 2013, I gave a presentation about my struggle with debt and recovering from bad decisions. A lot of people liked that presentation, so I revised it. So there's a lot of material that I had last time, but there's some new things in here. So basically, I wanted to talk about living in success city or failure mode. The interesting thing about my story is that I was the kind of person that got paid well for my work. I always put money in my 401k, and that money kept growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And by 2004, I had about $100,000 of cash. There was something <coughs> weird about adding another zero to a number because it kind of made my brain stop working right. I had some shortcomings. I really didn't know what the value of money really was. I didn't really know what $100,000 was. I did not know how to do financial statements. I had a big ego where I really thought I could do anything because after all, I'm a computer scientist and I can write software. So I really was in this place called Success City. I just didn't know it. So I got on the highway for failure bill, thinking that was success. <laughs> and then after being in failure bill for a while, I realized, you know, I'm really not succeeding here. Maybe I should be a little more humble, rethink how I'm doing things. And then with a humble spirit, having a negative net worth, I joined GD Rea in 2010. And I started thinking, gee, what did I do wrong? So this is really my story of my failures. And maybe you can learn something from it. I can figure out how to use this clicker. So basically, I had a $200,000 for $100,000. I looked at six properties, and I bought four of them. I just really thought I was really smart. And I had a very, very flawed attitude. I thought. If I can just hold on to these things, I will be okay. No, that is wrong. The correct answer is, if I make money on these things, I'm okay. Because there's something called financial statements you really need to think about. And over time, I successfully turned $100,000 of cash into about $100,000 of debt. You see, once I, I took my money that I had, and after I just started kind of throwing it away, you know, just Wait, not really realizing what it's worth, you know, I can pick those dollars up, and I trust me, I will. Here's some Romanian money. I can throw that away, too. You know, I just, I just didn't know what money was really worth. And I didn't know how to do financial statements. So you can see how, and that can really be a, a bad thing. And I was very successful at losing a lot of money. And I'll just go ahead and say, I was kind of stupid. I really was kind of stupid. So basically, uh, hopefully I'll figure out how to use this clicker. I believe I need to push this button to advance. There's an arrow there. So here, here's loser number one. Isn't that a, a gorgeous mansion? <coughs> yeah. Wow. That was built in 1859 by a very rich person that owned a company that that basically had a bunch of mines in Delphine. Isn't that? Wouldn't you love to own that property? That's gorgeous. It's a beautiful property. So I finally had to walk away from that one because the city determined that I needed a fire escape. Hmm. For it to be safe, I had to either redo the fire escape or put in some sort of water system. It's interesting, when this building burned, there's a picture of all the firefighters on that fire escape that wasn't strong enough. And this is another gorgeous house. This one was built in 1868. It's right next to the other one. It's an eight-unit building. What killed that one for me? was the same thing as, gee, you need a second exodus on that. What's that going to cost? Maybe $60,000. Time to walk away from that one. This other one here, 
This is loser number three. This one was built in 1886. It's a duplex. My property manager finally, finally called me and said, Scott, you know, I'm having trouble keeping tenants because this house is just really too old. So I went ahead and decided to get rid of that one. So I sold that one off finally. And then here's my other one. I sold this one in 2013. One of the interesting things about it is that this, this particular building had a, an apartment in it that had a six and a half foot ceiling. And you know, a tenant had been living there, actually like hmm. six and a half feet, but a tenant had been living there for a long time. He used to cut the grass for me. And then the, the city decided to adopt the international code rules. So they said, well, we can't issue a permit because the ceiling is too low, so you'll have to fix it. You can't fix a ceiling like that. So my property manager, not willing to fight me one, she just evicted the tenant on me, so not only did I lose the rent, but not also lost the guy that cut the grass. If I was smarter, and maybe if we had a RIA, I would have learned I should have contacted a lawyer to say, can the city really do this legally? And I imagine if I would have done that, I probably would have to stop the city from shutting me down. But I wasn't smart enough. You can see, remember, I was really smart. I'm a software engineer. I know how to run a company. I have lots of money. People are helping me with all this stuff. But my financials are really bad because when I bought when I bought these first two houses, you know, I got this big old check in the mail for the rent on all these properties. Then I got the utility bill. <laughs> you know, at that point, I should have realized that I should step away from this and take my losses. Because how long do you have to bleed before you realize that you're really not in the right business? But that's kind of my story on this. So basically, now I'm going to talk about how I sold these. There was a realtor that I actually sold me two of these properties. And he's a really sharp realtor, he's an investor. And I hired him to sell them. Because one of the interesting things is, does this sound like a legitimate way to calculate cap rate? That you just simply take the utility expenses and there's your cap rate. You know, I asked him about that and said, are you certain that's how you do cap rates? He said, Scott, that's how we do all our cap rates. Okay, so all your properties are overinflated. I said, well, okay. It's not selling it. Where were these properties at? What state? Belfont, Pennsylvania. So you just tell people all these cap rates, they're all phony. But there's something that Dave Ramsey said about buying real estate. Buyer beware. Buyer beware because remember, the realtor is paid by the seller. If any of you hire a realtor to sell your property, who do they represent? Because why do they represent you? Because they're paying them. Follow the money. So whenever we have these ideas of dual agency, that might be fine. There might be a piece of paper that says this person is a dual agent. But do remember there's a conflict of interest because that real estate agent is going to be paid by the seller to sell their property. Just remember that. So when you look at properties, either educate yourself on how to buy them or hire someone to tell you if it's a good deal or not. That was one of the big mistakes I made. But when I decided to sell them, I hired the same guy that sold me two of these properties. And part of it is is if something didn't work out with someone, does it really help to be angry with a person? If it isn't in your interest to be upset with them? I pretty much decided that my mistakes are my own mistakes. I own my own mistakes because I was just stupid. I better stop calling myself stupid. But I think I was pretty stupid back then. Not knowledgeable. I guess I could go with unknowledgeable, but stupid sounds better. Basically, so here, here's the problem is that I began to really realize that I got losers. What's a loser? A loser is a property that doesn't make you money. Does anyone have any of those? Of course, none of you have loser properties. You're all members of GD Rio, right? Exactly. Or you don't want to admit to it. I mean, you had one. But I didn't, I didn't realize I was losing for quite a while. So basically, one of the things that happened is once I ran out of money, all these banks said, here, you want some money? You need some money here. I'll, I'll lend you money, 0% interest. You need $20,000. You know, I, I, had, I had a furnace that, that was failing and the city would renew the furnace. And I said to myself, well, you know, if I don't put a furnace in the property, I won't be able to rent it out. So I, I borrowed $10,000 to 
to replace the furnace. It's a, a really cool furnace. It's one of those it's one of those furnaces that boils water. It's a steam heat. Really, really cool thing. You know, really a nice furnace that I put in. I should have taken a picture of myself by this nice furnace that someone else now owns. What, you know, I'll tell you what happened with that White House. I went, I flew to Belfont thinking I'm really, you know, this pretty sharp guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually get the loan on this property and buy it out. I went to do an inspection on these houses. The windows need replaced. No big deal. I understand that. He killed me in the White House. Well, it wasn't the real White House, but it was a White House. But, but I had to kind of make this plan where I wanted to look like I was gonna fix the problem, but really not fix it. So I, I put the house up for sale, and I, I knew I couldn't sell it. And I did everything I could to get rid of it. And finally, at the end, I said, you can have it back. And in the end, I just walked away from all these properties, took all my losses, and walked away. That's where I lost $100,000. But I got a lot of, another problem coming up. Why do, it, why, do, why do credit card companies lend you lots of money at low rates? Anyone know why they do that? I would just want to give money to someone for 0% for a year or something. Then you roll it on another card for a year, roll another card for a year. What, what do they eventually do? Raise the rate. Raise the rate. So let me ask you a question. What are you, what are you going to do when you have maybe $120,000 of unsecured debt and Chase raises the rate to 18%? File bankruptcy. File bankruptcy. You know, I think I can slide on that. Oh, bankruptcy, that's a nice segue. I really, I really kind of thought that was a wimpy way to get out of debt. Just really filing, because I have these things called ethics where I, I really should try to resolve my, my debt issues. So I, another thing was loan settlements. There, were, there are all these commercials about loan settlements, you know, we'll, we'll loan it. They want to basically have you give them the money and then not pay anyone for a while and they'll do all these settlements for you. That's the idea, but I really didn't want to give my money to someone else. Does anyone want to hand your money to some other party? Especially since you've met all these sharks along the way that screw you over on your property if you're not educated. Probably not a good idea. So I was talking to a guy at Bank of America and I just started laying everything out to him. You know, the reality of my situation and why I couldn't pay them. And he said, well, why don't you talk to this place called Money Management International. Does anyone, anyone know who Money Management International is? They're a consumer group that helps people resolve their debt. They'll negotiate lower rates with all your debtors, and you make the payments to them, and they'll pay all the other creditors. They're a very reputable group. And, and that actually worked out well because they got me really low rates. But I had a, I had a problem. I, I decided to move from Los Angeles to Dayton, Ohio, with my family, and my income dropped. And then, then I had a property that one of my losers, you see, I, I knew the two big ones were losers, but I had this thing where I borrowed money from Wells Fargo, and you all know you fill out these documents that say, I promise to pay you back. So I felt very bound to Wells Fargo to pay on my mortgage notes. Does anyone feel that way, that if you, if you get a loan and a mortgage note or property that you're obligated to pay the loan back to them? Anyone kind of feel that way? Yeah. Well, the one, the one thing I failed to realize is that actually they're business partners with you on that property. That if things go bad on your property, feel free to have the mortgage company pay part of it as well. Isn't that fair? I mean, didn't they get in bed with you on this property? And shouldn't they be willing to take a hit too along with you? And that, that reminds me of something. How many people care about their FICA score? <coughs> Why? It's a debtor score. Think about it. You're getting scored on how much of a good surf you are. <laughs> Think about it. In fact, people will play these games where they want their FICA score. There was this, there was this commercial I saw where there's a cute lady. She's sitting on this nice sofa. And she looks at the guy and says, I have, I have an 840 FICA score. What are you going to give me today? Oh, we'll give you the Ottoman sleep. They carry around like a princess. You know, and why, I'll ask you a question. Some woman comes into a furniture store touting her FICA score, and, and you, you give her a piece of furniture, and they, they sign some sort of a 12 month same as cash kind of deal. Wouldn't you be willing to carry her out on her new chair? If you 
you know, because she's now become your servant. Hasn't she? So when the bank says, well, gee, you want to make sure you make all your payments to keep your FICA score well. <coughs> if your property is losing 500, maybe a couple hundred a month, do you really want to be borrowing money? Probably not. So I think we all have the wrong perspective on debt in this country. Isn't it, isn't it better to just have cash? How many people like cash? And you know, the interesting thing about cash is if you live on a budget, guess what you always have? It's always in your pocket. Money's always there. So that's one of the things I learned. But anyways, what happened is I, I these things called inspections when tenants move out, I had to put a bunch of money in a loser property. So I borrowed more money to, to fix the loser property, and it still is a loser property. <coughs> Good old Wells Fargo, I better make sure I pay my mortgage with them. So basically, eventually what happened is I couldn't make the payments with my Money, money Management International deal anymore. And I called them up and said, in two months, I am not going to have enough income to make all these payments. And they could not do anything about it. So I finally ran into that day where I couldn't make the payments. What, what happens when you have no more credit? and your income doesn't meet your obligations, what, what happens that day? People stop getting paid. So I remember, I remember calling them up, and I decided to call PNC Bank up because they were the lady that gave me this loan was so nice and friendly, and I said, can we switch to interest-only payments? No, Mr. Taylor, you cannot switch to interest-only payments on your loan. So you know what I decided to do? I decided to start making interest-only payments to them because I just didn't have it. And I called, I called another, another, I guess I think I'll wait, okay, I'll go to the slide. And I called another bank up and I told them my situation, says, oh, that's okay. The thing was Citibank, well, tell you what we'll do. We'll lower your rate to 1%, we'll drop your payments to something you can manage, and we'll give you this deal for one year. And I suddenly realized, wow, if, if everyone did that, I could actually survive and actually pay this debt off. So I came up with this, this idea that if a bank is willing to work with me, I will pay them in full. If they don't work with me, then I'm going to stop paying them much money at all and tell them they're not qualified for getting money from me. And I, I really kind of like the statement here, don't let the sharks define the rules. Who came up with FICA anyways? Sharks. The sharks came up with it. And why did they do it? They want to keep all their serfs in line. Right? Keep the serfs worshiping FICA. Oh, FICA, thank you for my 800 score. I don't even know what my score is. I actually would like to not have a score anymore. But, but that was my experience with that. So basically, let me talk about some of these things. This is GM. Well, Scott, GM. Scott, yeah. one interjection though. We don't need to worry too much about FICA, but the thing about the score is, it also impacts your auto insurance, yeah. it impacts your home health insurance. insurance, it impacts home insurance. It's, you have to, don't worship it, but you still have to be cautious because the lower your FICA score, the more you will pay. But, you know, I have, I, have, I have a rebuttal of that right off. If you pay in cash for things, and you maybe have a credit card you, eventually, you kind of casually use sometimes, is FICA going to be a problem for you? If you don't have any FICA score, yeah. you're still going to pay it higher. That's right. Well, anyways, okay, I made fun of FICA. Yes, it matters a little bit, but my point is we, we worship it too much because basically, I start telling these banks that, you know, I, I don't care about FICA because I can't meet my expenses, so it doesn't matter. But, but GM never really raised my rates above 7%. seven percent. They never sent me nasty letters. They, they did charge me penalties, which is fair, and guess how much they got paid? They got paid in full. Could you live with 7% interest on a, on, a, on a card? I could, so I got paid in full. Chase, well, Eventually, they, they agreed to pay off agreements with low interest rates, and 
after not being paid for a while. So I, I would call them up and say, yes? I want to make a comment I read recently that mortgages are included in your credit score, and now rents are going to be included in the FICA score as well. They weren't here before. Well, what my comment I have is if you pay your bills and you live on, on uh, using a financial statement and use a budget, then these shouldn't be problems for you anyways. But my, my point here is that because Chase, after not being paid for a while, I just would come up and say, hello, what's today's rate? 18%, can you give me 2%? No, we can't, you don't qualify. Oh, you don't qualify to be paid either. And then I remember the phone call I got from, from I think it was Discover. They said, Mr. Taylor, now when someone calls you by Mr. or something, usually it means they want your attention, says we need to do something about this, this debt. What would you have in mind? Well, I'll tell you what, we will forgive all your penalties. We'll give you a 2% rate if you'll agree to a payment plan that's drafted from your checking account every month. Sure, that's fine. So we did that. And so they got paid in full because they weren't willing to work with me. And it goes back to this whole thing. If your creditor lends you money stupidly, then they should suffer with you because they trusted you. And you know, it's kind of joint suffering is my feeling on that. And since they were since they were willing to work with me, they got paid in full. PNC Bank, this is a very interesting story. After getting small payments, interest only payments, the bank manager decides to sweep my PNC account of maybe fifty dollars. I call them up and try to tell them my situation. They threaten to sue me for being a failure. So my company went bankrupt, you know, oh, we're going to sue you for that. So really nasty with me. So guess what I did? I started paying them less money. And then after a while, they, I got a phone call from a law firm that agreed to a 0% interest pay, pay down uh, after six months of uh, minimal payments to TNC Bank. So I was very thrilled, like, yes, someone's going to work with me. So what they did is they sold the loan off. And mm -hmm. So I was willing to work with the person that bought them. And that's an interesting thing. You buy notes. So you have a creditor, someone that has a note somewhere that's been punished and punished and punished. And then you buy the note and you call them up and you say, can we work out a deal? And you offer this person that has this note a deal. You think they might want to start paying you. I sure was. So what, what's really interesting is that apparently they, they sold it again. Because I received a phone call when I just happened to be between jobs, demanding full payment, and they offered me a 50% settlement. So what they did is they had sold it to one person that resold the loan as non only loan to someone else who called me up, who offered me a 50% settlement when I was making my payments. So I would have really thought that BNC Bank was just not very smart. So I really like this because I borrowed $10,000 from my dad right there and said, Dad, so I know you love Southern companies. They pay you 5% dividends every year. I tell you what, I'll pay you more than that. And the reason why I'll do that is because I get a two for one deal if I settle this loan. And I did pay you back, didn't I? With interest, right? And what I do when I didn't pay you for a few months because I had trouble making your payments? I pay you the interest part of it, not the principal. So that was really interesting. Capital One, they were like the toughest negotiators of all. <coughs> This lady called Linda called me every day. You ever know when we meet Linda from Capital One? <laughs> Linda called me all the time. So I, I would call him back and say, may I, may I speak to Linda? <laughs> Who's Linda? Well, Linda's uh, the lady that keeps calling me all the time. You know, I just want to speak to her. She's there. And then, you know, I'd see how long I'd keep this little thing going. And then say, oh, oh, you mean the automated thing? Yes, yeah, so is she there? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, we can't talk to her. But, and I'd say, okay, that's fine. Well, what rate can you give me today? Oh, 8%. Oh, shoot. Well, you don't qualify. How about how about 1%? Let me check. No. Okay. We went around and around and around. They finally gave me percent. And towards the end of all this, I really had most of the stuff paid off. I ended up settling for 90% of the loan because I felt I just don't want to take vengeance against them because they've been jerky and I don't really need the settlement anymore. So I got that one paid off. 
So basically, they were nice at first, but then after 12 months, they raised the rate to 29.99%. Is that a fair rate? Wow. And they refused to negotiate on this. And by then, I got a little savvier. And I said, well, what do you guys want? What are you guys doing? Don't you want to get paid? You know, can't you do something better? No. So I just stopped paying them. Stopped paying them. And in six months, they offered me a 50% settlement. And I don't know why they did that, but I played this to my advantage. You see, I can blame them for this, right? And I guess one of the things I learned is that when you get in debt, your ethics start heading south. Has anyone ever experienced that? And when you get in financial trouble, you start being tempted to do things that are unethical. And I start feeling some of that stuff. So it wasn't, oh, I couldn't talk about US Bank. They never raised my interest rates beyond the introductory rates. They, they never called wanting to collect uh, minimum payments. And when I called them to thank them for being so nice, they offered me a 50% settlement, and I settled with them as well. Hmm. The only problem with this particular <coughs> settlement is US Bank won't lend me any more money anymore. <laughs> Even though my FICA score is pretty cool now, and you know, I mean, I have everything's perfect. You know, I can resettle. You know, I can refinance my house. It goes down the road. Goes down to writing up. No, you can't. You can't lend money to this person. So, oh well, that's unfortunate. But I do have an account with them. I like U.S. Bank, and I appreciate them. I always say nice things about U.S. Bank. But here's a problem I ran into. Anyone have, I'm sure there's some people here that have security clearances or experience with that. They always say that if you get into financial trouble, you need to, you need to talk to them about it. So there came a day where I talked to my security officer about my debt, and that kicked off all kinds of interesting things. They wanted me to fill out all these documents. It kicked out, kicked out another background check of me because I was working on, on pretty, pretty secret stuff at the Air Force Base at the time. So here's my strategy. I said, sure, I'll give you a monthly report on my financial status. And by then, I was doing financial statements. So here's my strategy. I will bury them with information. <laughs> I remember going to my fax machine, put a big stack of paper in it, push the button, walk around the office for 20 minutes while I sent all those documents to the fax machine to someone at the, uh, the NSA. Actually, it was NGA, National Geospatial Organization. So, and my security person, I'd give him a copy of this and say, you know, Scott, I don't care what's in here, but I'll stick it in an envelope and stick it in the file. Eventually they said, stop sending us documents. <laughs> so that was, that, was, that was kind of fun in a way because I was definitely serious in convincing them that I am doing something about this problem. So I started doing these financial statements in March of 2010. Anyone want to guess where I got the idea for doing financial statements? Any guesses at all? David Ram. Cash flow. Cash flow, yes. Anyone play cash flow? What's the game really about? It's about financial statements. So I literally took the form from the game and sent out my wife and did a financial statement. And the problem with the form is it just didn't line up with how my finances work. But that was so powerful because every month I know exactly where I am every single month. Isn't that kind of amazing to know where you are every month? And that way if something's not working for you, you can <laughs> fix it. If something's not making money for you, you should change it. And that's the big thing I learned. So last time I gave a, a discussion, I, I totally bored people with financial statements, but I, I, think it's, I think it's important to talk about them, so I try to make it pretty simple. You take a piece of paper and one side, you list all your assets. You go through all your checking accounts, all your savings accounts, all your IRAs, everything you own, write it down on one side and, and have a number at the end of what all your assets are. And then on the other side, you list all your liabilities and you write down the liability number is. And then you subtract your liabilities from your assets and you get a number. Now you think that might take a little bit of effort to do that the first time you do it? Yeah. Well, what about the following month? Do you think it might be a little easier to do it? Yeah. And the month after that? And then what about after the 60th month? think it might be pretty easy. Anyone want to guess how long it takes me to do this with paper and pencil every month? 
Any guesses how long it takes me to do the financial statement? 20 minutes. Exactly 20 minutes, exactly. <laughs> because all I basically do is I have a little spreadsheet that has all the URLs of all the various sites and I go on and just fill it all out and I get a number. And it's a very, very, very powerful number to do this. Now, how many people do financial statements? Few people. Not surprised that investors would want to know their financials because if you don't know where you are financially, what's what's potentially going to happen? You're not going to make money. Now, the one thing I also learned is about. I had been doing financial statements for a while. My wife and I took a Dave Ramsey class, so we went to this Financial Peace University. And we learned a new thing about budgeting, where at the beginning of the month you sit down and, and you kind of do your budget and you, you take your money and all your spending money, you put in little envelopes and you, you spend with cash. And how many people believe that, that when you spend cash, the way you make decisions is the same as if you use credit? Yes. Well, that's interesting because I've met lots of people I've talked about using cash and they say, oh, I have the same spending pattern as with credit. Let me tell you a story. I went to a Bands of America contest in Indianapolis, Indiana, and this was at a time I was really, really tight with money. And they wanted like two dollars for a, a glass, you know, a bottle of water. I had five dollars in my pocket. So if I buy the thing of water, how much money would I have? Wow, that's what percentage loss is that? Forty percent loss on water. I wouldn't do this now, but because I was so tight with money, I actually found myself a container, cleaned it out really, really well, and filled it up in the bathroom to save those two bucks. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. And one time I was out with my daughter, and we were at McDonald's, and I said, Rose, we have $8. We need to split the $8. That's all we have. I'm not, I'm not using credit. So she goes out and orders something that's like $5. And then I'm a little frustrated about it, but they have a special. I can get two sandwiches from McDonald's for two dollars. So because I had eight, I spent eight. How much do you think I would have spent about a debit card? Four, Sixteen. Eight. I would have spent more than eight. <coughs> so it's very powerful. Plus, you have money that I threw on the floor because I happen to have this money with me today. I, I will pick it up. Trust me. <coughs> so I, I had done this little chart in 2013 because you know I had like. Here's where I decided to put money in the loser, and that didn't help it at all. And then I, I had little things where a tenant moved out. You can see it bumped up a little bit. I did a student loan. My son had bumped up. On this bottom one, the yellow one is my uh, cash supply I have. But you can see that because of discipline, the debt went down, the wealth went up, and that's where I was in uh, August of 2013. And what happened is, because I was doing these financial statements every month, and I'm getting this number, you, you can put it in Excel and, and produce a little chart. So now I start putting these charts on my wall to look at. And I'll tell you a story. One time I was working at a company and the, the CEO asked me to come in and, and said, I, I don't mean to insult you, but one of, my, one of our customers wanted to know why we don't pay our employees enough because he saw your car sitting in, in our parking lot. And I just want to know why you, you drive such a beat up car. So I said, just a moment, I brought my financial statements and said, I really don't care about the car, I care about these numbers. <laughs> and that was fine. So she said, can you just park the car somewhere else? <laughs> so so I, I, that worked out fine. But this is what's important. And in 2013, this is what I had. You know, I basically had a camera account for 10000 and I was scared to do anything with it. And I had, uh, was trying to start saving a $15,000 emergency fund because it's nice to have cash if something happens. Anyone like to have cash around if something bad happens. Yes. And then I, I had some fidelity investments as growing funds. I, I bought into a deal with some people here in GD Rio. And I kind of thought that was a pretty good place to be in 2013. And then I was also doing stocks with Investor Business Daily. And in the end, I kind of realized that I never really figured this out. So I'm saying, you know, I really don't get the numbers, so I, I don't even look at the stocks anymore. I, I just buy things that they go up in value, like maybe Southern companies, I own some of that stock that my dad told me about. But this is what I kind of said in 2013. I, I wanted to go continue paying cash for non-invested items. I wanted to get rid of all unsecured debt by 2014. I worked really, really hard at that. I want to invest my 
10K of the camera on something. I wanted to keep growing my investments. I wanted to get my $15,000 in my emergency funds. Those are my goals. This is what's kind of happened since then. I, I do keep paying cash for things. If it's not investments, I'll pay cash for it. I did get rid of all my debt in 2014. It was neat to see that number go to zero, and I wondered, what do you do now once you get all your debts paid off? I did invest my 15K in a private mortgage note paying 13%. So here's the interesting thing. I went from owing people money to telling people owe me money. And how long did it really take for that to happen? It started in 2010, and now I'm lending money out. 2000 and I guess that started in 2000 and Let's see, this is 16. So I bought this last year. It's interesting how I bought this. I was talking to a GD Rhea member about maybe buying a property, and his advice was, are you really in a mental place to buy property? And I said, maybe not. I bought a note and got 13%. And sometimes I whine about, I'm only getting 13% while their REIA members are getting a 20% you know, ROI in this property and that property. But compared to the rest of the country, isn't 13% a pretty good return? Yes, sir. It's not bad. And how hard do I have to work for that 13%? Don't do anything, do I? So all I basically did is I had a 401k, which happened to be a simple IRA, and I just put the company match into it, let it grow, and then it grew to a point to where I could buy a mortgage note and get these higher numbers. So the interesting thing is when you get bigger numbers, guess what happens? There's bigger opportunities. Mm -hmm. So if you just save your money, you can find things to invest in and they really pay off pretty well. And now I'm putting money in my LexisNexis 401k and we did get our $15,000 in our emergency fund, which was kind of cool. And it was nice when I got the tax bill this year, I can just write a check for it, don't have to fret about it. And so that's been really, really good. And the other thing I discovered is I have a pension fund that I, I kind of forgot about. Does anyone ever forget about funds that you have? <laughs> I mean, I, I just I just didn't realize I had this, this $30,000 in a pension fund because I've been working on my life and the company that I work for had a pension fund, so I, I kind of discovered that. But now that I have financial statements, I decided to put that on there as well. And I found out that, well, maybe, maybe I wasn't as deep in the hole as I thought I was because if I actually look at my assets and produce things, even though I owned a bunch of losers, I still had assets that were producing something. And now this big hill that looked really high and, and challenging, 120,000, notice that, that that thing's not as high anymore because this wealth number has gone up pretty high. And the other interesting thing is I started calculating velocity. Does anyone know what velocity of money is? Exactly. So what I start plotting is, is what's my velocity of my, my wealth increase over a 12-month period every month? And I started plotting that. And the interesting thing I noticed is that when I got this settlement, because I live on, I live, I live on by the Austin Pike Interchange, and they want to do eminent domain, they give you a big chunk of money that I use to do settlements. Notice that that line there is $65,000. So there was a, there was a month where I had actually advanced my wealth $65,000 in 12 months. And part of it was being smart about how to deal with my debt. But I only learned this once I started actually plotting all the numbers that I had. And I like this red line because that's, that's money that's actually making me money. So the, the nice thing about charts is when you work really hard to, to grow your business, you can look at how you're doing. And the, the, the yellow line is my debt. You notice there's little bumps there. Those are called having to pay taxes and things like that. <laughs> but, you know, it's been pretty, or medical issues come up. But it's been a really interesting road to, to do that well. I, you know, would I believe that I would be able to, you know, reach a net worth of 177000 in six years? Now, I, I do admit, as a software engineer, you get paid well. But I really feel, though, is it about how fast or the fact that you're moving a certain direction? That was one of my, my observations about this. And then here's the velocity chart. I really wondered how on earth did I reach over $30,000 of positive velocity in, in one year? 
Yeah, would you explain that again? I couldn't hear what you said. I think so. What velocity is? Well, all I start doing is that I, I have this spreadsheet with all these numbers on it, and every every column is a month. And I got thinking, well, how much has it changed over 12 months? So this is March of 2000. This is what, obviously April of 2016. Where was I in April of 2015? So I subtract the 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 net worth of of this month from. I subtract from it where I was one month ago and I plot it. So I got this interesting velocity chart. And the reason why it's so high is because there's things called taxes that I, I keep declaring exempt every year and I end up having to pay now because I don't have all these write-offs anymore. And the reason why this is so high is yes, the last two months are pretty good, but also I had a really, a really bad month here. So I kicked that up. So guess what's gonna happen next month? That's probably going to go down to about there. But it's just interesting information. I mean, if you, how many of you would like to know what your velocity is? Would you like to know, are you going up, are you going down? I mean, would it be helpful to really know where you are financially? I find this very, very helpful to me. And here's my 12 month chart. Like, what have I done in 12 months? You know, I've gone from maybe 100 and was at 150,000 up to like 177,000 in net worth. My my money that's actually making money for me is growing. Let's see what is this green line? I think that's my cat. I forget what that one is. I should remember what they are. Oh, that's my velocity number. And then here's the debt on the bottom. But I find this just helpful to track where you are. Oh, how many people would like to drive a car like this? This, this car, I bought this car for my son so he can drive to college because he was paying 800 a month to live on campus. And I thought it would be cheaper to live at home, so I bought this $3,000 car and, and suggested he commute to it. He got a T-Bone. So he, he, he can't drive a T-Bone car. I mean, it would be so shameful to drive a T-Bone car like this one. So I, I found out that the frame was not damaged at all. I mean, the alignment is still correct. So mechanically, the car is fine. So I gave him $500 for it and just kept driving it. And I drove it for well over a year. And then my dad had a car. And I bought, I bought my dad's car from him. It's a really nice Honda or a Hyundai Sonata. And I was upset about having to spend $2,000 because it hurts my financials to spend two grand because what I had to show for it. I must say it's a nice car. And the interesting thing about having cash is when do you spend the cash? when a super great deal shows up. So how could I turn my dad down? He has this nice, nice car, plus I have to drive him places anyways. So I, I guess what kind of person I sold the car to? Any guesses? I sold it to another real estate investor. Imagine that. How many, how many people care more about their assets and less about their fancy car? No, my, my children my children refuse to drive this car, period. My my son had a had this car in the shop. They refused to use that car. My, my wife had to drive it to school. But anyways. Now here's an unexpected blessing. My oldest son is completing his MS in computer science in December of 2016 and his student loan will be paid in full. Oh my god. Any curious curiosity how he did that? Yeah. Well, the first thing we did, we went to a super great school in the state of Ohio that's a great price, Wright State University. I, I basically helped put the bill for the first year and said, you get a chance on, college, on campus. I worked with him to get a good paying job. A job. He can make money, he can live at home, he can commute to, to college. And, and because he has his bachelor's now in computer science, he makes pretty decent money. He has a, he has a nice car. It's a, it's a few years old. You pay about five thousand for it, but it can be done. So why why have student loan hanging over your head when there's other solutions? And my other son, I loaned my son Noah thousand dollars to start eBay business, and I first prototyped the business. He's turned a thousand dollars into four thousand and paid it back. And now he's looking for more products to sell. And uh, I guess he's kind of like Donald Trump who paid his debt back too. I'm pretty proud of them. I wondered, would they be as financially successful as they are if I hadn't failed? 
remember, I didn't know what financial statements were. I didn't know the value of money. I just put my money in my 401k and let it grow. I didn't realize how well I was doing. So maybe sometimes failures are really good because they teach you things. So here's my, here's my current project. You know, my, my dad uh, moved up here and I wanted needed to sell his property because he's moving up here. It didn't take long to assemble a team of people, a realtor, stager, cleaner, bug killer, repair person. And the way I found that is I first called someone I knew. I got the realtor by simply going on a Remax and saying I need a realtor. And then I called a broker and saying how good is this realtor that, that I'm hiring. I, just, I, I called the broker's office and said I want to talk to the owner of the brokerage. You know, his name, I figured out his name was. I called the local uh, realtor association. There's only said he has that. And I said, well, you know, Sue's doing this. How good of a broker is she? Because I'm in, and I just asked him honestly, and I figured, are they gonna? If you're a brokerage, you're gonna give a lead to one of your non-performing leads. I hope you want. So that's worked out. Why? Fine. But I found the stager through a contact I had who had done work for me in the past, and the person helped me a rehabber that led me to the stager, and the stager led me to the repair person, and then when bugs need to be cleaned, they were they were a member of the local. B&I organization, because they had a business relationship, I was able to get the bugs killed quickly for a good price. Now, is it is it luck or talent to go into a city and assemble a team to get something done? I think it's probably a mixture of both, because if I hadn't been a part of GD RIA, do you think I would have known how to do that? That's why I come here. That's why I became the educational chair. Yes, Dad? I think it's something about Scott. After this deal, I actually made $68,000 on the sale I paid, but 28 for the house. It's allowed me to move here from Louisville, Kentucky, be next to my family. And I'm debt free, I don't have any debts at all, so I pay cash and just write a check. So it's, thanks to Scott. The other interesting thing is about how my dad bought that house. I, what was I, I suggest you do? Why don't you walk around the, the yeah. neighborhood yeah. and why don't you ask people about what house they would buy? And someone said there was this vacant house, and, and yeah. didn't I suggest to you, why don't you offer them a really low bid on it? I did. And he even made it lower than I thought. And the realtor said, yeah. no one will accept a bid like that. Guess what happened? Well, it turned out to be a, a three bedroom, three bath house, and a, a very nice place. I had to do very little repairs on it. So when the real estate agent looked at it, Scott called me back, and he says, Dan, you can get 68000 with that house. I said, wow, I doubled my money. And that's, uh, that's more than double, isn't it? <laughs> so he learned a lot of things in a very short period of time, let me tell you. So I guess my dad's made more off GD Real than maybe I have because <laughs> I felt not to buy the house. The thing is this. And I sold the house. I'm going to be 80 some years old come, come this month. The key is stop borrowing money. Pay yep. cash, even if you have to wait. I have no debts. I owe money to nobody except my income taxes. That's it. I haven't been that way for about five years now. It's a good deal. Thanks to Scott. Okay? He's going to guide me on this thing. Listen to him. He knows what he's talking about, believe me. Well, thank you for the vote of confidence. So, but it's been a rough road. I mean, I had to really fail really bad to figure this stuff out. So this is what I'm doing now. I mean, it's interesting how money collects over time. So what I do with surpluses, you know, like, there's this thing about security. You know, people think differently. My wife feels more about security, and I thought, you know, if I if I agreed to get to have mortgage paid off in seven years, you know, my wife would be kind of excited about that. And eliminating 150,000 of debt in seven years is not a bad thing to do. And I wonder if she could like get behind that project of getting rid of the debt of the house. But I'm not certain if that's really uh, has a tax issue. So I'm probably going to look at that more. So I'm going to I'm going to talk to my my account and say, what should I be thinking about for tax planning and then make an education, educated decision as to what to do next. But I have <coughs> this mortgage note coming up in 2016 at the end of the year, so what am I going to do with my $20,000? You know, maybe I'll actually buy a property. Maybe I've gotten far enough past my failures to actually be comfortable with actually buying something. That might happen. You know, I have some other funds when HECA finally pays me out because they probably can get a better rate than paying me 13 or 14 percent a year on my notes with them. What am I going to do with that money? And this pension fund comes due in 2018, what to do with that? 
So the, the thing I'm noticing is that when you start saving cash, what begins to happen with it? It accumulates, doesn't it? And then with, and when you when you buy a, a note paying 13% and you get $3,800 back in two years, what do you do with $3,800? You reinvest it. So I think though that my point is that having solid financial discipline is really a foundation to wealth building, at least that's been my experience. So here's my, my formula. And I got this from Robert Kiyosaki. He said, do well at your job. Become a specialist and really do that job really, really well. Always do a good job because I've been in software engineering for 28 years. I've been in the same profession all those years and maybe if you get really good at something, you might get paid more for it. So that's been what I've done. And have good monthly budgets, financial statements, hang out with smart people. And who are my smart people? Yes. All of you. <laughs> I have learned so much from people at GB Rio. I've been so inspired by people. And in fact, does anyone know the goddess of the South, Nina? Yeah, So Nina friended me on uh, Facebook, and I said, I am honored to be your friend. She said, I'm honored to be yours too. Isn't that kind of neat to, to know people that are so successful by first name? And I mean, it just floors me to be able to hang out with, with all of you. So invest wisely. And my best investments have been with people with GD Rita. Oh, and I wanted to end on, on private money exchange. I, I became a vendor with private money exchange mostly because I wanted to be a vendor. I wanted to have something to talk about. I thought notes were boring. So I thought if I, if I had some something I could represent that would be kind of neat, and I really want to talk about private money exchange a little bit, that basically Cobo Capital offers a 65% funding loan to value for two-year interest only notes. And how it basically works is that they have to be non-owner occupied properties. You have to do the purchase in your business entity or your self-directed IRA. Interesting, how many people outside of this room would know what a self-directed IRA is? They don't. Not me. So I just throw it up on the slide just saying, OCO, use your self-directed IRA. And if you don't have one, there's hang around long enough, you'll find people that can tell you about it. Probably half a dozen people can tell you about self-directed IRAs and where to call about those. And uh, you do an application to your business entity, it has to have good profit potential. That's the formula, that's what they're looking for. And then they'll they'll sell those notes. Because imagine, let's say you have $100,000 to fund some deals, and someone shows up and they give you a deal that matches all this stuff, and you lend them the money at 15%. What if you sell that note off to someone else and, and, and for 13%? What have you done for yourself? Let's say you lend someone $100,000 at 15%, someone buys that note from you at 13%, you have your $100,000 back, don't you? And how much money are you making off your $100,000? 2%. Do you are making 2%. So imagine having an investment where you get your money back and you get paid for it every month. So the, the person that got the note, you know, they're the Basically, the loan, the loan handling company takes their payment, and the loan handling company gets Cobo Capital, 2% of it, and they give 13% to the person who bought the note, and then they do it again, and do it again, and do it again. So the, the note I bought, you know, is $1,500 or $15,500. You know, as of December, it's paid me $2,560. That's not bad money, is it? And I put that money in a brokerage account, and I bought stocks which actually have done kind of well this year. So that's, uh, if you want to know more about uh, Product Money Exchange, you can log on my website, register, and they'll send you all kinds of documentation information about it. So that pretty much completes you my presentation. Copy it down. Pardon me? Sure, I give you my card as well. Any questions? Yes, Kay. I was curious, um, back towards the beginning of your presentation, you had said that you somehow owed the IRS $14,000 for the purchase of your house because oh. of the way you bought it. What happened there? Well, that's an interesting story because I was living in California, and 
they had this really cool thing in El Segundo where they had this Halloween bash on Main Street. And when I looked at my, my wife's face, she was not happy. And in that moment, I realized we need to move back to Dayton, Ohio. So what I did is I got her a plane ticket, got her a hotel, got her a little car, and said, you find a house. And she found a house, and I got the house accepted before she returned to Ohio. And what I did is I, I decided I was going to cash in my IRAs, IRA money to buy this house. So I had some money sitting around. So we were able to get the house and I ended up buying it with, uh, I bought an option because the mortgage company wanted me to have a job in Ohio to give me the mortgage. There's a, there's a bank that has 5-3 in their name and they just weren't willing to give me a loan. They kind of told me what I wanted to hear but at the end kind of pulled the rug underneath me. So I called the, the real estate agent and said, can we do something creative on this? So they offered me a $15,000 option on this house and with a rental agreement for three months, and then I hired a, a broker to get me the loan, which they got me the loan, and I got the house, but the problem was I cashed my IRAs, and the IRS came back and said, you owe us $14,000. My accountant sent me an email message with the subject line, perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Because I, I owed the IRS $14,000, I owed the state of California about $1,000, I owed the state of Ohio about $400 or something. A lot of money, especially when you up to your eyeballs in debt. By the way, the state of California, the taxpayer's bill of rights is on a single sheet of paper. You want to know what it says in California? You have no rights. <laughs> it basically says that uh, we have the right to liquidate all your property to pay off all your debts, and we charge you the low rate of about 5% a month. Interest. 55% interest a year on tax debt in the state of California. So what happens if you own property and you can't pay your bills? They'll just take everything from you. So a dad, can I borrow $1,000 from you because the state of California has been really nasty. I promise to pay you back. I put you in first place on all my debt. You lent me the money and got rid of California. Ohio is different. They said they're going to pay in full, but they'll do payments if you don't pay them in full. And the IRS is very cheerful. By the way, the IRS, one year they refused to give me my uh, refund one year because of some technicality with my loan for a previous year, which was not able. But Yes, I mean, you need to look at your taxes when you, when you cash in your IRA. It's probably a really bad idea, but my wife only needed a house. And then the state of Ohio decided to run into Maine giving her $5,000, so I actually bought the house with nothing down in the end. That was just luck. That was not planning. I didn't know that they were going to build this interchange called Austin Pike, up 1.5 miles from my house.